created in the body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mother of the ship, the captain of the ship, the mother of all organs, the love of my life, <laughs> the squishy thing that I love to see in person. If it's coming out of an ear, I love it. Okay. Bad thing. Do. Any open skull. It's just fascinating to me. So we know the brain is made up of the central nervous system, which is the brain, the cerebrum, um, the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is the nerve roots and the peripheral <coughs> nerves. Okay? Um, <coughs> You have spinal pathways, and you have afferent pathways and efferent, afferent and efferent, okay? Your afferent is always going to be your sensory, okay? And remember, um, somebody explained it, which I really, really liked. Um, they, they talked about the military. And what he said is basically, when you're in the military, if you get... Um, if I'm a private and you're a private and we talk to each other, it's a basically a law order of orders. So it's like the private giving orders, the one at the bottom giving orders, it's not really taking us seriously. So if a private to private says, your shoe is untied, you're going to say, okay. Okay, it's coming from the bottom. Okay, doesn't require any action. Okay, might elicit action, but it doesn't give action. Now from the top to the bottom, the e frame, which is descending, descending, ascending, which is sensory, means that it's coming from the bottom to the top. Okay? <coughs> and e frame, which is descending, means that it's coming from the top to the bottom. So if a captain in the military gives you an order and says, your shoe is untied, you say, yes, sir, and you go down and you tie it immediately. That requires action. So if you're thinking of it, think of efferent coming from the top, okay? It's going to actually elicit a response. And then afferent coming from the bottom is giving information, okay? So if you give a sensory, so if you have a sensory stimulus coming from the bottom, it's actually given information. It's saying, your shoe is untied. You go, okay, thanks. That's information, it's given information. When you're getting from the top up, down, it's a command, it's an order, okay? So your efferent is actually given a command. It's innervating your effector organs. Your afferent is a sensory input that's sending information to the brain, okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So we have the somatic nervous system, and it's basically um, voluntary, okay? So it's a voluntary motor, how we control our arms, our legs, that's voluntary, that's somatic, okay? <laughs> um, and it controls the skeletal muscle system. The autonomic nervous system, which we kind of touched on a little bit, I didn't give you guys too much of it, but the autonomic nervous system is basically, we don't have to think about it, it happens. I don't have to say beat heart, it beats, okay? I don't have to say, you know, um, um, initiate peristalsis, it doesn't, okay? Those things happen automatically. So that's your autonomic nervous system. It's not innovative, you're not doing anything, but it's happening, okay? And that's your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. Okay? These are your neurotransmitters that are governed by your autonomic nervous system. Okay? And so your visual organs, your internal body compartments are innovated by your autonomic nervous system. Okay? It's your autonomic nervous system, and you remember your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. Remember your sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight. Your parasympathetic nervous system is your rest and digest. This is what actually was designed to protect us. It's the way we protect ourselves, okay? The way that the, the master creator or 
however we got here, I've created for us to protect ourselves. Okay? And <clears throat> we said that the, the sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight. So you're thinking of running. Okay? You're thinking of defending. You're thinking of, I got to stand up. So your sympathetic nervous system, you know, your heart's beating really, really fast. The minute you, I don't care who you think you are, the minute somebody's opposing you and ready to fight, your heart rate increases. That's your sympathetic nervous system, okay? So on your test later on today, if you get a question that asks you if a drug is blocking the parasympathetic nervous system, that means it's stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. And if it's stimulating the sympathetic nervous system, it's going to accelerate the heart rate, it's going to increase the blood pressure, it's going to dilate the pupils. Right? Yep. Okay. Somebody still doesn't get that wrong. <laughs> That's an answer. You got one answer right there. Okay. Huh? Give another one. <laughs> okay. So the neuron, we hear a lot about the neuron, okay? And the neuron is the primary way that the brain sends information. It's the communication. We know that we have neurons, which are cells, the communication cells. And they are um, the, they're like the myocytes of the heart. The neurons are like the myocytes of the heart, okay? Um, we have different sizes, but we have like 10 billion neurons. We have a whole host of them. And they are just going at it in a daily. If we take, uh, we, that's why I don't like football, American football. Because when I watch American football, every time I see somebody hit their head, I go, that's 10,000 years. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like the worst thing. I think my boyfriend hates when I watch football with him. He used to want me to watch it. And now he goes, no. <laughs> you just ruined it for me. I said, no, I don't. Because every time I see somebody does this, I say, that's a billion neurons. <laughs> and he just goes, don't, don't say anything, just sit down there. Okay? Because it's true. Okay? There are millions of neurons just in the tip of a pen. is about a billion neurons you're killing at a time. So can you imagine every time they hit their head and bumps up against their skull and they have it's neurons, you're killing. And once you kill neurons, they do not regenerate. They're dead. Okay? Now we have a lot, so we do have some to spare. But I need all my neurons. Okay? What about you? I need all my neurons. Okay? So Variable size and structure throughout the nervous system, okay? Um, olfactory, um, they divide again. When they die, they do not come back alive, okay? How's the neuron made? Anybody ever seen this picture? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, this is your neuron, okay? And your neuron is made up of a soma, which is your cell body, okay? And you ever heard a neurologist talk about gray matter versus white matter? Okay. So when you hear them talk about gray matter, they're talking about this part of the cell, the soma. Okay. This is the top part of the cell. If you ever look at the brain, if you ever look at a picture of the brain, let me see if I have one here. We ever see a drawing of a brain, you'll see them have, like on the outside, you see, I'm really bad at drawing, I'm sorry. You usually see that this part is darker, right? And then you will see inside here is another darker area. Inside here is another darker area. But outside here. And then in between you have some light areas. Okay? 
The basal ganglia is actually gray matter. The outside here is usually gray matter. So <clears throat> the gray matter is this. It's your cell body. Okay? Then you have your axons. Okay? Your axons is your white matter. Okay? And your axons is covered by the Schwann cells, which actually is made up of um, myelin. This is your myelin sheet, okay? And in between, you look right here, you see in between there, those are areas in between are nodes of Ranbir, okay? Just little slots in between here. And these are your dendrites. So cells interlock either by the dendrite, or a cell body to cell body, or at their synaptic knobs. Okay? And that's usually how it works. Okay? So, again, your three parts, your soma, which is the cell body. Okay? You have the dendrites, which is the receptive part, those little tentacles. Okay? And you have the dendritic zones, the receptive portions of the neuron. And then you have the axons, which carry nerve impulses away from the cell body. Okay? So if I'm going to take information, I'm going to process it in that cell body, and then I'm going to send it down the axon to actually transmit it to another cell body, okay? depending on how they plug closely the enough together. Okay? Um, myelin. Myelin is basically the insulation. It's made up from the Schwann cells, okay? And <clears throat> when you see the myelin sheet is degenerated, you think of diseases like multiple sclerosis, you think of things like um, myasthenia gravis, all these things um, actually can de destroy your myelin sheet, okay? So when we're talking about those diseases, you're thinking about that area, the axon that carries the information that's losing, no, actually it's not weakening, it's actually losing its, its cover. It's losing its cover. So if it's losing its cover, its ability to, to send information completely is kind of interrupted. interrupted. You have like a, a jag in between, so it's kind of interrupted, okay? And that's what we look at. Um, Nodes of Ranvier, interruption in the myelin sheet. Um, you have salutary conduction, and their transmission between ions, okay? Divergence, ability to blend axons, and convergence, branches of numerous um, neur neurons converging at one or few neurons. We need to worry about those. I'm not going to touch on that. Okay, sensory neurons. Sensory neurons transmit impulses from the periphery to the brain. Okay. So if I slam my finger, it says pain, and it takes that information through the spinal cord, and the spinal cord takes it up the spinal thalamic tract into my brain, into the somatosensory area, to be interpreted as pain to my left finger. Okay. That's how it's traveled. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the spinal cord. Motor neurons transmit impulses from the central nervous system to the effector organs. So your motor neurons are in your motor strip. And your primary motor strip is in the back of the frontal loop. It's your pre-central um, gyrus. So it's in front of the central gyrus, back of the frontal lobe, and that's where your motor strip is. And if your sensory uh, neurons send information to the brain that says the phone is falling on your finger a thousand times, it sends that information up. I mean, there's an automatic reflex that actually pulls it back, okay? But it's going to tell you, okay, it's the finger, it's what's going on. If I have to do anything with that arm after, that central nervous system is going to send an impulse back down and say, hey, you got to hold your arm up, or you gotta put your arm down. Whatever you need to protect yourself, it actually is gonna tell it that, 
So you get information from the motor strip to say walk. You get information from the motor strip to say um, move your arm, move your leg. The motor strip sends that motor impulse or motor information down to the body or to the effector organs to actually work. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Which information is correct regarding associational neurons? What are associational neurons? I skipped over it in the slide because I think you'd be able to tell me what associational neurons are. Without looking at the bottom of the slide. <laughs> well, link, yes, but what does that tell me? Which one of these answers tell me because there's a link? Oh, four. Four. Yes, because it transmits impulses from neuron to neuron. Associational. Neuroglia, we have a whole lot of neuroglial cells. And neuroglial cells are basically just a structural, functional, it's not a functional unit, it's a structural unit of the body, of the brain, I should say. Okay? So you have the structural, which actually uh, aids in, in defining the brain, and then you have the functional. The functional is the neurons, the structural is the neuroglial cells, which is basically your astrocyte, oligodendrocytes, okay? These are your glial cells. So when you hear someone has a glioma, these are the cells that are really being affected. If they have an astrocytoma, they have an abundance of abnormal astrocytes that's growing, okay? Oleg oligodendrioma, all the same things. Ependymoma, same things, okay? The ependymal cells line the, the um, insides of the ventricles, okay? And those are what you get when you have an append. Um, they're also um, epithelial cells because they line the inside of the ventricles, but they're um, basically um, neuroglial cells that actually provide structure to the um, ventricular CS, um, system. So these are examples of these types of cells. Don't ask me which one's which. Mm. Okay. So Schwann cells. We said that Schwann cells is the myelin, okay? It's formed. They form the myelin, okay, of the axons, and we need the Schwann cells because they increase conduction velocity. If we don't have myelin, we don't have conduction velocity. Okay. Wallerian degeneration. Um, we talk about peripheral nerves and peripheral nerves um, regenerating, um, and this basically is just saying that Wallerian degeneration says that if you cut the um, peripheral nerve distal to it, it may regenerate. However, if you do a straight cut, it usually doesn't regenerate. The only way you degenerate is if you do like a, like a pounding. Um, so um, let's say someone has a, a disc um, protrusion. So they have a central disc that actually comes out in the spinal cord and it's pressing on this peripheral nerve. It's actually not sheer force, it's just a pressing force, so it's actually gonna smush it. <coughs> that may regenerate, okay? But if I take a knife and I cut the peripheral nerve straight across, it's not gonna regenerate, okay? So, Warrenian um, degeneration says a per myelin sheet shrinks and degenerates, and then the axon portion degenerates and disappears. But if it's, a, it's a, um, a straight across cut, they usually will just disappear and they won't regenerate. If it's flattened, the possibility of them regenerating is very, um, is more likely. Yeah. Um, so again, regeneration depends on the location and the type of injury. Um, anytime you damage a nerve cell, you get this inflammatory response, so you get the swelling, um, you get the, um, the macrophages, you get the same type of inflammatory process. Again, it depends on the type of injury, whether it's going to regenerate or not. Okay. Nerve impulses. <coughs> same action potential. Nerve impulses actually go at a really rapid rate. 
And what drives them, okay, is neurotransmitters, okay? You have different neurotransmitters. We talked about epinephrine and norepinephrine. Those are neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine, neurotransmitters. Next ones that um, you probably hear about, and, and you're not even realizing it, is GABA. You give neurontin, it's a GABA inducer. GABA is a neurotransmitter, okay? Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. These are all neurotransmitters that are in the body. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, okay? The reason why we give drugs that block dopamine when someone is like schizophrenic is because <coughs> dopamine is a pleasure neurotransmitter, okay? Um, when we do well, we get hits of dopamine, okay? When we um, conquer something, we get hits of dopamine. When we take drugs that enhance dopamine, or makes us feel good, um, dopamine. Dopamine is the pleasure neurotransmitter. That's why people want it, okay? Serotonin, same thing. Oxytocin is another neurotransmitter that does the same thing, okay? People want hits of happiness. That's why they take these drugs, okay? So these are neurotransmitters, and basically, these neurotransmitters drive neuronal activity, okay? We get neuronal activity based on the release of these neurotransmitters. Okay. Synapses. These are regions between the adjacent um, <clears throat> neurons. And basically, neurotransmitter, you get an action potential that synapse across cell membranes from one cell body to another, and it's driven by neurotransmitters. Again, neurotransmitters form in the neuron, they're stored in the synaptic bulb, and they're actually released when we have an action potential. Okay. Many types of neurotransmitters, we went over them. Um, most of them going to ask you about neurotransmitters, so um, it's going to be pharmacology. Um, and if I ask you something about neurotransmitters here, I'm just going to ask you something very basic. So don't. No, think you have to know all 46 types because you're not, not, not even necessary. Okay. Did you say that in the schizophrenic we have to block the dopamine type? Yes. Why would you want to do that? Because usually they're very hyper. They have, they're, they're, when you have a, um, a, a schizophrenic, they have states of euphoria. And when they're euphoric, is dopamine. So if you block dopamine, it decreases this euphoria. I'm going to talk about those next week when we talk about your dopamine antagonist, drugs, and pharmacology. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to decrease their euphoria. Okay, so we have neuronal excitation. And you actually, the cell depolarizes, the neuron depolarizes, um, and the excitatory postsynaptic actual potential is generated. Um, they actually um, release neurotransmitters, and they actually meet at the synaptic class. Don't think you have to remember what the depolarized excitatory postsynaptic potentials are. You don't, you're not going to be tested on those. Okay. And I'll tell you what to pay attention to. What I'll test you on. Okay. Summation determines whether the action potential occurs or not. Uh, <clears throat> they may be facilitated. Um, you have temporal or spatial summations. And all this all depends on the neurotransmitter um, activity and the neuronal activity, which you don't really need to know. Now, you do need to know the divisions of the brain and how they work because this will help you to determine pathology, okay? So the forebrain, you um, see when a, a fetus is developing, they have this big thing, then they have like, it, it almost looks like, it's like this. It looks like that. It comes down and has a piece here, and then it looks like that, no? Isn't that what a fetus looks like? Pretty much. Yeah. Give or take. Yeah, like big, big, so that is huge. Yeah, like that. <laughs> like one of my drawings. But that's what it looks like, doesn't it? Okay. 
And usually they have the forebrain, the midbrain, and then the hindbrain. Okay? Usually developed. The hindbrain, the forebrain is basically two um, cerebral hemispheres. The midbrain um, is the um, the midbrain and the cerebellum peduncles. And then the hindbrain is cerebellum um, pons and medulla, which is your um, primitive brain. Remember, your high, your primitive brain is your brain stem. Okay? It is your primi primitive brain because no higher cortical function occurs in the brain stem. The brain stem has your cranial nerves and it basically has heart, lung, everything function. You don't want anything to happen to the brain stem because when you're dealing with real estate, especially in the brain, you know what's prime real estate and what's not so prime real estate. And the brain stem, when you're thinking about function, is prime real estate, okay? <laughs> So when you're thinking about it, I want you to think about prime real estate. Like um, when you're considering the brain, I want you, I want you to do th two things. We're gonna talk about a whole lot of stuff um, when we talk about the brain, but I want you to remember, there's prime real estate and there's not so prime real estate. So prime real estate in Miami is probably Brickle, Miami Beach. A certain parts of Miami Beach. No, let's just do Brickle or Coral Gables. That's prime real estate. Okay, you can try to buy a house there, and it's probably going to cost you millions, right? That's prime real estate. Now, if I try to buy a house in Opa Locker, it's probably not going to cost me millions. I can get away with a hundred or two hundred thousand. It's not so prime real estate. Okay. Now, I want you to think about it. If a water main breaks in Brickle, okay, how fast does it get that repaired? Very fast. <laughs> Like this. Water main break in um, Opalanka. <laughs> uh, they call in city, calling, and nobody's coming. Okay? That's so prime real estate. So when we talk about different areas of the brain, I want you to think about prime real estate and not so prime real estate. Because the prime real estate is where you're going to act fast. Well, you're going to act fast where there's brain tissue, anyways. But the not so prime real estate is where you don't want anything to happen. And the prime, uh, the pri not so prime real estate is where things can happen, but it's not so dramatic. The not so prime, um, the prime real estate is where you don't want anything to happen. You want to keep that intact, okay? And when we talk about things like that, we're talking about things like the brainstem, okay? The brainstem is made up of a um, very small midbrain, which is on top, a um, pons, which is the middle part, okay? almost looks like a drunken man with a big belly. And then the medulla, which is the last part. The medulla is where the brain stem meets the spinal cord, okay? And that's where your um, higher order function, um, such as your heart, um, respiratory, all that is located at, okay? Most of your cranial nerves are housed in the brain stem. There are only two cranial nerves that are not housed in the brain stem. And that's cranial nerve one and two. Every other cranial nerve is housed in the brainstem. Okay? The reticular formation is a network of nuclei that's actually come up from the brainstem, going through the thalamic area, the diencephalon, and it actually goes up into the cerebral cortex. And what it does is that it keeps people awake. It's your wake center. Okay? Uh, if you knock out the reticular activating system, you can have someone who is alive but just constantly sleeping. If you ever go to a neurological floor and you see someone who has a bilateral hemispheric strokes, large bilateral hemispheric stroke, you may see them just laying in the bed and they're just sleeping all the time. But if you put food in front of them, they'll, they'll just eat and they won't choke. But their ability to stay awake is altered because they've knocked out the reticular activating system, okay? So the forebrain, um, telencephalon, which is your cerebrum, okay? You have the cerebral cortex uh, and the basal ganglia. You have a whole bunch of gyri and sulci. The brain, if you take it and you unwrap it, is a really big thing. It looks like um, that that cartoon, that's not a cartoon, it's a movie where the guy's head is like round and big, okay? If we, if the brain doesn't fold, 
it would actually look like that. It wouldn't be like a big giant balloon. So how we were divinely created is that we have these soul signs, the gyrides. The gyrides are the folding under of the brain, okay? And then we have the soul size or where it separates, or where there's a separation of the brain. So if um, my neurosurgeon wants to go in and remove a tumor that's uh, actually in um, the frontal lobe, he can actually pull the soul size apart to get into, um, if it's a deeper structure, to get into where the tumor is, okay? The gyrides, the soul size, and then the fissures. The fissures are like soul size. They're also divisions, but they're actually deeper. Okay. And then we talked about what gray matter is versus white matter. Gray matter is like intelligent tissue. It's like all those neurons. You can see there's this guy, and he, uh, you have two patients. You have a patient in bed A that has a stroke, and it's like this big here. And he's walking, and he's talking, and he's doing everything. And then you have someone in bed B, and he has a stroke here. And he can't talk. He can't understand. Because he's actually not covered. That's part of his intellectual tissue, gray matter, but he's not covered. Okay? So it's very important to know where the stroke is. Okay? No, Alzheimer's, they're, they're thinking that they have uh, plaques and these tangles that actually um, form into the brain. Um, a lot of times they think it's a prolonged hypertension, they think it's, but they're not really sure exactly what it is. It's just plaques and tangles that actually grow inside the brain that no one actually has a good answer. Um, what they're doing is studying people postmodern to try to figure out what is actual cause of it. But it's hard. There's a, a theory about acetylcholine, um, and there is not enough acetylcholine in the brain in some people, and that's why they think that happens. But there's not good answers. Okay. So the ridges are your gyrides. All these folds. And there's like a whole bunch of specific gyrides but this itself is a gyri right here. This is another gyri right here. This is another gyri right here. This probably is another gyri right here. And they all have names, okay? All of them have very, well, yes, very, a lot of names, okay? Like easy? Huh? Like easy? No. Not only not enough, no. Very true. Very true. Very specific. Very specific.